The memoirs of Nehemiah son of Hakoliah.it was the month of Kislev in the twentieth year. At the time I was in the palace complex at Susa. Hanani, one of my brothers, had just arrived from Judah with some fellow Jews. I asked them about the conditions among the Jews there who had survived the exile, and about Jerusalem. They told me, the exile survivors who are left there in the province are in bad shape. Conditions are appalling. The wall of Jerusalem is still rubble, the city gates are still cinders. When I heard this, I sat down and wept. I mourned for days, fasting and praying before the God of heaven. I said, God, God of heaven, the great and awesome God, loyal to his covenant and faithful to those who love him and obey his commands, look at me, listen to me. Pay attention to this prayer of your servant that I'm praying day and night in intercession for your servants, the people of Israel, confessing the sins of the people of Israel. And I'm including myself, I and my ancestors, among those who have sinned against you. We've treated you like dirt, we haven't done what you told us, haven't followed your commands, and haven't respected the decisions you gave to Moses your servant. All the same, remember the warning you posted to your servant Moses, if you betray me, I'll scatter you to the four winds, but if you come back to me and do what I tell you, I'll gather up all these scattered peoples from wherever they ended up and put them back in the place I chose to mark with my name. Well, there they are, your servants, your people whom you've so powerfully and impressively redeemed. O oh Master, listen to me, listen to your servant's prayer, and yes, to all your servants who delight in honoring you, and make me successful today so that I get what I want from the King. I was cupbearer to the king. It was the month of Nisan in the twentieth year of Artaxerxes the king. At the hour for serving wine I brought it in and gave it to the king. I had never been hangdog in his presence before, so he asked me, why the long face? You're not sick are you? Or are you depressed? That made me all the more agitated. I said, Long live the king. And why shouldn't I be depressed when the city, the city where all my family is buried, is in ruins and the city gates have been reduced to cinders? The king then asked me, so what do you want? Praying under my breath to the God of heaven, I said, if it please the king, and if the king thinks well of me, send me to Judah, to the city where my family is buried, so that I can rebuild it. The king, with the queen sitting alongside him, said, How long will your work take and when would you expect to return? I gave him a time, and the king gave his approval to send me. Then I said, If it please the king, provide me with letters to the governors across the Euphrates that authorize my travel through to Judah, and also an order to Azaph, keeper of the king's forest, to supply me with timber for the beams of the temple fortress, the wall of the city, and the house where I'll be living. The generous hand of my God was with me in this and the king gave them to me. When I met the governors across the river, the Euphrates, I showed them the king's letters. The king even sent along a cavalry escort. When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard about this, they were very upset, angry that anyone would come to look after the interests of the people of Israel. And so I arrived in Jerusalem. After I had been there three days, I got up in the middle of the night, I and a few men who were with me. I hadn't told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. The only animal with us was the one I was riding. Under cover of night I went past the valley gate toward the dragon's fountain to the dung gate looking over the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken through and whose gates had been burned up. I then crossed to the fountain gate and headed for the king's pool but there wasn't enough room for the donkey I was riding to get through. So I went up the valley in the dark continuing my inspection of the wall. 
I came back in through the valley gate. The local officials had no idea where I'd gone or what I was doing, I hadn't breathed a word to the Jews, priests, nobles, local officials, or anyone else who would be working on the job. Then I gave them my report, face it, we're in a bad way here. Jerusalem is a wreck, its gates are burned up. Come, let's build the wall of Jerusalem and not live with this disgrace any longer. I told them how God was supporting me and how the king was backing me up. They said, we're with you. Let's get started. They rolled up their sleeves, ready for the good work. When Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem the Arab heard about it, they laughed at us, mocking, Ha! Ah, what do you think you're doing? Do you think you can cross the king? I shot back, the God of heaven will make sure we succeed. We're his servants and we're going to work, rebuilding. You can stick to your own business. You get no say in this, Jerusalem's none of your business. The high priest Eliashib and his fellow priests were up and at it, they went to work on the sheep gate, they repaired it and hung its doors, continuing on as far as the Tower of the Hundred and the Tower of Hananel. The men of Jericho worked alongside them, and next to them, Zachar son of Imri. The fish gate was built by the Hassana brothers, they repaired it, hung its doors, and installed its bolts and bars. Mirmoth son of Uriah, the son of Hakaz, worked, next to him Meshullam son of Barakiah, the son of Meshizabal, next to him Zadok son of Bana, and next to him the Tekoites, except for their nobles, who wouldn't work with their master and refused to get their hands dirty with such work. The Jeshana gate was rebuilt by Joyada son of Pasea and Meshullam son of Besadiah, they repaired it, hung its doors, and installed its bolts and bars. Melatiah the Gibeonite, Jadon the Maranathite, and the men of Gibeon and Mizpah, which was under the rule of the governor from across the Euphrates, worked alongside them. Uzziel son of Harhiah of the goldsmiths' guild worked next to him, and next to him Hananiah, one of the perfumers. They rebuilt the wall of Jerusalem as far as the broad wall. The next section was worked on by Rephaiah son of Hur, mayor of a half-district of Jerusalem. Next to him Jediah son of Harumaf rebuilt the front of his house, Hadash son of Hashabnia worked next to him. Malkijah son of Haram and Hashub son of Pahath Moab rebuilt another section that included the Tower of Furnaces. Working next to him was Shalom son of Halahesh, mayor of the other half-district of Jerusalem, along with his daughters. The valley gate was rebuilt by Hanan and villagers of Zenoa, they repaired it, hung its doors, and installed its bolts and bars. They went on to repair 1,500 feet of the wall, as far as the Dung Gate. The Dung Gate itself was rebuilt by Malkijah son of Rechab, the mayor of the district of Beth Hakram, he repaired it, hung its doors, and installed its bolts and bars. The Fountain Gate was rebuilt by Shalon son of Kalhos, mayor of the Mizpah district, he repaired it, roofed it, hung its doors, and installed its bolts and bars. He also rebuilt the wall of the Pool of Siloam at the King's Garden as far as the steps that go down from the city of David. After him came Nehemiah son of Azbuk, mayor of half the district of Beth Zur. He worked from just in front of the tomb of David as far as the pool and the house of heroes. Levites under Rehum son of Bani were next in line. Alongside them, Hashabiah, mayor of half the district of Kila, represented his district in the rebuilding. Next to him their brothers continued the rebuilding under Binui son of Henadad, mayor of the other half district of Kila. The section from in front of the ascent to the armory as far as the angle was rebuilt by Ezer son of Jeshua, the mayor of Mizpah. 
From the angle to the door of the house of Eliashib the high priest was done by Baruch son of Zabbai. Mirmoth son of Uriah, the son of Hakaz, took it from the door of Eliashib's house to the end of Eliashib's house. Priests from the neighborhood went on from there. Benjamin and Hashub worked on the wall in front of their house, and Azariah son of Messiah, the son of Ananiah, did the work alongside his house. The section from the house of Azariah to the angle at the corner was rebuilt by Binui son of Henadad. Halil son of Uzai worked opposite the angle and the tower that projects from the upper palace of the king near the court of the guard. Next to him Padiah son of Parash and the temple support staff who lived on the hill of Awful worked up to the point opposite the water gate eastward and the projecting tower. The men of Tico did the section from the great projecting tower as far as the wall of Awful. Above the horse gate the priests worked, each priest repairing the wall in front of his own house. After them Zadok son of Immer rebuilt in front of his house and after him Shemaiah son of Shechaniah, the keeper of the east gate, then Hananiah son of Shelemiah and Hanan, the sixth son of Zalaf, then Meshullam son of Berechiah rebuilt the wall in front of his storage shed. Malkijah the goldsmith repaired the wall as far as the house of the temple support staff and merchants, up to the inspection gate, and the upper room at the corner. The goldsmiths and the merchants made the repairs between the upper room at the corner and the sheep gate. When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall he exploded in anger, vilifying the Jews. In the company of his Samaritan cronies and military he let loose, what are these miserable Jews doing? Do they think they can get everything back to normal overnight? Make building stones out of make-believe. At his side, Tobiah the Ammonite jumped in and said, That's right. What do they think they're building? Why, if a fox climbed that wall, it would fall to pieces under his weight. Nehemiah prayed, Oh listen to us, dear God. We're so despised, boomerang their ridicule on their heads, have their enemies cart them off as war trophies to a land of no return don't forgive their iniquity, don't wipe away their sin, they've insulted the builders. We kept at it, repairing and rebuilding the wall. The whole wall was soon joined together and halfway to its intended height because the people had a heart for the work. When Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the Ashdodites heard that the repairs of the walls of Jerusalem were going so well, that the breaks in the wall were being fixed, they were absolutely furious. They put their heads together and decided to fight against Jerusalem and create as much trouble as they could. We countered with prayer to our God and set a round-the-clock guard against them. But soon word was going around in Judah, the builders are pooped. The rubbish piles up. We're in over our heads. We can't build this wall. And all this time our enemies were saying, they won't know what hit them. Before they know it will be at their throats, killing them right and left. That will put a stop to the work. The Jews who were their neighbors kept reporting, they have us surrounded, they're going to attack. If we heard it once, we heard it ten times. So I stationed armed guards at the most vulnerable places of the wall and assigned people by families with their swords, lances, and bows. After looking things over I stood up and spoke to the nobles, officials, and everyone else, don't be afraid of them. Put your minds on the master, great and awesome, and then fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. Our enemies learned that we knew all about their plan and that God had frustrated it. And we went back to the wall and went to work. From then on half of my young men worked while the other half stood guard with lances, shields, bows, and mail armor. 
Military officers served as backup for everyone in Judah who was at work rebuilding the wall. The common laborers held a tool in one hand and a spear in the other. Each of the builders had a sword strapped to his side as he worked. I kept the trumpeter at my side to sound the alert. Then I spoke to the nobles and officials and everyone else, there's a lot of work going on and we are spread out all along the wall, separated from each other. When you hear the trumpet call, join us there, our God will fight for us. And so we kept working, from first light until the stars came out, half of us holding lances. I also instructed the people, each person and his helper is to stay inside Jerusalem, guards by night and workmen by day. We all slept in our clothes, I, my brothers, my workmen, and the guards backing me up. And each one kept his spear in his hand, even when getting water. A great protest was mounted by the people, including the wives, against their fellow Jews. Some said, we have big families, and we need food just to survive. Others said, we're having to mortgage our fields and vineyards and homes to get enough grain to keep from starving. And others said, we're having to borrow money to pay the royal tax on our fields and vineyards. Look, we're the same flesh and blood as our brothers here, our children are just as good as theirs. Yet here we are having to sell our children off as slaves, some of our daughters have already been sold and we can't do anything about it because our fields and vineyards are owned by somebody else. I got really angry when I heard their protest and complaints. After thinking it over, I called the nobles and officials on the carpet. I said, each one of you is gouging his brother. Then I called a big meeting to deal with them. I told them, we did everything we could to buy back our Jewish brothers who had to sell themselves as slaves to foreigners. And now you're selling these same brothers back into debt slavery. Does that mean that we have to buy them back again? They said nothing. What could they say? What you're doing is wrong. Is there no fear of God left in you? Don't you care what the nations around here, our enemies, think of you. I and my brothers and the people working for me have also loaned them money. But this gouging them with interest has to stop. Give them back their foreclosed fields, vineyards, olive groves, and homes right now. And forgive your claims on their money, grain, new wine, and olive oil. They said, we'll give it all back. We won't make any more demands on them. We'll do everything you say. Then I called the priests together and made them promise to keep their word. Then I emptied my pockets, turning them inside out, and said, So may God empty the pockets and house of everyone who doesn't keep this promise, turned inside out and emptied, everyone gave a wholehearted, Yes, we'll do it, and praised God. And the people did what they promised. From the time King Artaxerxes appointed me as their governor in the land of Judah, from the twentieth to the thirty-second year of his reign, twelve years, neither I nor my brothers used the governor's food allowance. Governors who had preceded me had oppressed the people by taxing them forty shekels of silver, about a pound, a day for food and wine while their underlings bullied the people unmercifully. But out of fear of God I did none of that. I had work to do, I worked on this wall. All my men were on the job to do the work. We didn't have time to line our own pockets. I fed 150 Jews and officials at my table in addition to those who showed up from the surrounding nations. One ox, six choice sheep, and some chickens were prepared for me daily, and every ten days a large supply of wine was delivered. Even so, I didn't use the food allowance provided for the governor, the people had it hard enough as it was. Remember in my favor, O oh my God, everything I've done for these people. 
When Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had rebuilt the wall and that there were no more breaks in it, even though I hadn't yet installed the gates, Sanballat and Geshem sent this message, Come and meet with us at Kephrim in the valley of Ono. I knew they were scheming to hurt me so I sent messengers back with this, I'm doing a great work, I can't come down. Why should the work come to a standstill just so I can come down to see you? Four times they sent this message and four times I gave them my answer. The fifth time, same messenger, same message, Sanbalat sent an unsealed letter with this message. The word is out among the nations, and Geshem says it's true, that you and the Jews are planning to rebel. That's why you are rebuilding the wall. The word is that you want to be king and that you have appointed prophets to announce in Jerusalem, there's a king in Judah. The king is going to be told all this, don't you think we should sit down and have a talk? I sent him back this, there's nothing to what you're saying. You've made it all up. They were trying to intimidate us into quitting. They thought, they'll give up, they'll never finish it that I prayed give me strength. Then I met secretly with Shemaiah son of Deliah, the son of Mehetabel, at his house. He said, let's meet at the house of God, inside the temple. Let's find safety behind locked doors. Because they're coming to kill you. Yes, coming by night to kill you. I said, why would a man like me run for cover? And why would a man like me use the temple as a hideout? I won't do it. I sensed that God hadn't sent this man. The so-called prophecy he spoke to me was the work of Tobiah and Sanballat, they had hired him. He had been hired to scare me off, trick me, a layman, into desecrating the temple and ruining my good reputation so they could accuse me. Oh my God! Don't let Tobiah and Sanballat get by with all the mischief they've done. And the same goes for the prophetess Noadia and the other prophets who have been trying to undermine my confidence. The wall was finished on the 25th day of Elul. It had taken 52 days. When all our enemies heard the news and all the surrounding nations saw it, our enemies totally lost their nerve. They knew that God was behind this work. All during this time letters were going back and forth constantly between the nobles of Judah and Tobiah. Many of the nobles had ties to him because he was son-in-law to Shechaniah son of Ara and his son Jehohanan had married the daughter of Meshullam son of Berechiah. They kept telling me all the good things he did and then would report back to him anything I would say. And then Tobiah would send letters to intimidate me. After the wall was rebuilt and I had installed the doors, and the security guards, the singers, and the Levites were appointed, I put my brother Hanani, along with Hananiah the captain of the citadel, in charge of Jerusalem because he was an honest man and feared God more than most men. I gave them this order, don't open the gates of Jerusalem until the sun is up and shut and bar the gates while the guards are still on duty. Appoint the guards from the citizens of Jerusalem and assign them to posts in front of their own homes. The city was large and spacious with only a few people in it and the houses not yet rebuilt. God put it in my heart to gather the nobles, the officials, and the people in general to be registered. I found the genealogical record of those who were in the first return from exile. This is the record I found. These are the people of the province who returned from the captivity of the exile, the ones Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon had carried off captive, they came back to Jerusalem and Judah, each going to his own town. They came back in the company of Zerubbabel, Jeshua, Nehemiah, Azariah, Ramia, Naamani, Mordecai, Bilshan, Mispareth, Bigvi, Neam, and Bana, the numbers of the men of the people of Israel by families of origin, Parash, 
172 Shephatiah, 372 Ara, 652 Pahath, Moab, sons of Jeshua and Joab, 2, 818 Elam, 1, 254 Zahu, 845 Zakkai, 760 Binui, 0.648 Bibay, 628 Asgad, 2, 322 Adonicum, 667 Bigvi, 2, 067 Aden, 0.655 Atair, sons of Hezekiah, 98 Hazham, 328 Bazai, 324 Harif, 0.112 Gibeon, 95. Israelites identified by Place of Origin, Bethlehem and Nedipha, 188 Anathoth, 128 Beth Asmaveth, 42 Kiriath Jerim, Kephra, and Beeroth, 743 Rama and Geba, 621 Mike Mash, 122 Bethel and Ai, 123 Nebo, the other one, 52 Elam, the other one, 1, 254 Harem, 320 Jericho, 345 Lod, Hadid, and Ono, 721 Sina, 3, 930. Priestly families, Jediah, sons of Jeshua, 973 Immer, 1, 052 Pashur, 1, 247 Harem, 1, 017. Levitical families, Jeshua, sons of Cadmiel and of Hodaviah, 0.74. Singers, Azaf's family line, 148. Security guard families, Shalom, Ater. Talman, Akub, Hadada, and Shobai, 0.138. Families of support staff, Ziha, Hasufa, Tabayoth, Kuras, Sia, Padan, Labana, Hagaba, Shalmai, Hanan, Gittel, Vihar, Ria, Rezin, Nakoda, Gazim, Uzza, Pasia, Bisay, Munim, Nafusim, Bakbuk, Hakufa, Harher, Basleth, Mahida, Harsha, Barkos, Sisera, Tima, Nizia, and Hadifa, families of Solomon's servants, Sotai, Sophereth, Parida, Jala, Darkon, Gittel, Shephatiah, Hattil, Pokereth, Hazabane, and Ammon, the temple support staff and Solomon's servants added up to. 392. These are those who came from Tel Mela, Tel Harsha, Carib, Adon, and Immer. They weren't able to prove their ancestry, whether they were true Israelites or not, the sons of Deliah, Tobiah, and Nakoda, 642. Likewise with these priestly families, the sons of Hobiah, Hakaz, and Barzillai, who had married a daughter of Barzillai the Gileadite and took that name. They looked high and low for their family records but couldn't find them. And so they were barred from priestly work as ritually unclean. The governor ruled that they could not eat from the holy food until a priest could determine their status by using the Urim and Thummim. The total count for the congregation was 42,360. That did not include the male and female slaves who numbered 7,337. There were also 245 male and female singers. And there were 736 horses, 245 mules, 435 camels, and 6,720 donkeys. Some of the heads of families made voluntary offerings for the work. The governor made a gift to the treasury of 1,000 drachmas of gold, about 19 pounds, 50 bowls, and 530 garments for the priests. Some of the heads of the families made gifts to the treasury for the work, it came to 20,000 drachmas of gold and 2,200 minas of silver, about one and a third tons. Gifts from the rest of the people totaled 20,000 drachmas of gold, about 375 pounds, 2,000 minas of silver, and 67 garments for the priests. The priests, Levites, security guards, singers, and temple support staff, along with some others, and the rest of the people of Israel, all found a place to live in their own towns. By the time the seventh month arrived, the people of Israel were settled in their towns. 
Then all the people gathered as one person in the town square in front of the water gate and asked the scholar Ezra to bring the book of the revelation of Moses that God had commanded for Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the revelation to the congregation, which was made up of both men and women, everyone capable of understanding. It was the first day of the seventh month. He read it facing the town square at the water gate from early dawn until noon in the hearing of the men and women, all who could understand it. And all the people listened, they were all ears, to the book of the Revelation. The scholar Ezra stood on a wooden platform constructed for the occasion. He was flanked on the right by Mattathiah, Shema, Aniah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Messiah, and on the left by Padiah, Mishael, Malkijah, Hazham, Hashbadana, Zechariah, and Meshullam. Ezra opened the book. Every eye was on him, he was standing on the raised platform, and as he opened the book everyone stood. Then Ezra praised God, the great God, and all the people responded, Oh yes! Yes, with hands raised high. And then they fell to their knees in worship of God, their faces to the ground. Jeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub, Shabbatai, Hodiah, Messiah, Kelata, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, and Peliah, all Levites, explained the revelation while people stood, listening respectfully. They translated the book of the revelation of God so the people could understand it and then explained the reading. Nehemiah the governor, along with Ezra the priest and scholar and the Levites who were teaching the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to God, your God. Don't weep and carry on. They said this because all the people were weeping as they heard the words of the revelation. He continued, Go home and prepare a feast, holiday food and drink, and share it with those who don't have anything, this day is holy to God. Don't feel bad. The joy of God is your strength. The Levites calm the people, quiet now. This is a holy day. Don't be upset. So the people went off to feast, eating and drinking and including the poor in a great celebration. Now they got it, they understood the reading that had been given to them. On the second day of the month the family heads of all the people, the priests, and the Levites gathered around Ezra the scholar to get a deeper understanding of the words of the revelation. They found written in the Revelation that God commanded through Moses that the people of Israel are to live in booths during the festival of the seventh month. So they published this decree and had it posted in all their cities and in Jerusalem, Go into the hills and collect olive branches, pine branches, myrtle branches, palm branches, and any other leafy branches to make booths, as it is written. So the people went out, brought in branches, and made themselves booths on their roofs, courtyards, the courtyards of the Temple of God, the Water Gate Plaza, and the Ephraim Gate Plaza. The entire congregation that had come back from exile made booths and lived in them. The people of Israel hadn't done this from the time of Joshua son of Nun until that very day, a terrific day. Great Joy Ezra read from the book of the revelation of God each day, from the first to the last day, they celebrated the feast for seven days. On the eighth day they held a solemn assembly in accordance with the decree. Then on the twenty-fourth day of this month, the people of Israel gathered for a fast, wearing burlap and faces smudged with dirt as signs of repentance. The Israelites broke off all relations with foreigners, stood up, and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their parents. While they stood there in their places, they read from the book of the revelation of God, their God, for a quarter of the day. For another quarter of the day they confessed and worshipped their God. A group of Levites, Jeshua, Bani, Kadmiel, Shebaniah, Buni, 
Sherebia, Bani, and Kenani, stood on the platform and cried out to God, their God, in a loud voice. The Levites Jeshua, Cadmiel, Bani, Hashabnia, Sherebiah, Hodiah, Shebaniah, and Pethahiah said, On your feet. Bless God, your God, for ever and ever. Blessed be your glorious name. Exalted above all blessing and praise. You're the one. God, you alone. You made the heavens. The heavens of heavens, and all angels. The earth and everything on it. The seas and everything in them. You keep them all alive. Heaven's angels worship you. You're the one, God, the God. Who chose Abram. And brought him from you are of the Chaldees. And changed his name to Abraham. You found his heart to be steady and true to you. And signed a covenant with him. A covenant to give him the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, and the Amorites, the Perizzites, Jebusites, and Jergeshites, to give it to his descendants. And you kept your word, because you are righteous. You saw the anguish of our parents in Egypt. You heard their cries at the Red Sea. You amazed Pharaoh his servants, and the people of his land. With wonders and miracle signs. You knew their bullying arrogance against your people. You made a name for yourself that lasts to this day. You split the sea before them. They crossed through and never got their feet wet. You pitched their pursuers into the deep. They sank like a rock in the storm-tossed sea. By day you led them with a pillar of cloud, and by night with a pillar of fire, to show them the way they were to travel. You came down onto Mount Sinai. You spoke to them out of heaven. You gave them instructions on how to live well, true teaching, sound rules and commands. You introduced them to your holy Sabbath. Through your servant Moses you decreed Commands, rules, and instruction You gave bread from heaven for their hunger You sent water from the rock for their thirst You told them to enter and take the land Which you promised to give them But they, our ancestors, were arrogant Bullheaded, they wouldn't obey your commands they turned a deaf ear, they refused to remember the miracles you had done for them. They turned stubborn, got it into their heads to return to their Egyptian slavery. And you, a forgiving God, gracious and compassionate, incredibly patient with tons of love, you didn't dump them. Yes, even when they cast a sculpted calf, and said, This is your God, who brought you out of Egypt, and continued from bad to worse. You in your amazing compassion, didn't walk off and leave them in the desert. The pillar of cloud didn't leave them. Daily it continued to show them their route. The pillar of fire did the same by night. Showed them the right way to go. You gave them your good spirit to teach them to live wisely. You were never miserly with your manna. Gave them plenty of water to drink. You supported them forty years in that desert. They had everything they needed. Their clothes didn't wear out. And their feet never blistered. You gave them kingdoms and peoples. Establishing generous boundaries. They took over the country of Sion king of Heshbon. And the country of Og king of Bashan. You multiplied children for them. Rivaling the stars in the night skies. And you brought them into the land. 
that you promised their ancestors. They would get an own. Well, they entered all right. They took it and settled in. The Canaanites who lived there. You brought to their knees before them. You turned over their land, kings, and peoples. To do with as they pleased. They took strong cities and fertile fields. They took over well-furnished houses. Cisterns, vineyards, olive groves. And lush, extensive orchards. And they ate, grew fat on the fat of the land. They reveled in your bountiful goodness. But then they mutinied, rebelled against you. Threw out your laws and killed your prophets. The very prophets who tried to get them back on your side. And then things went from bad to worse. You turned them over to their enemies. Who made life rough for them. But when they called out for help in their troubles. You listened from heaven. And in keeping with your bottomless compassion. You gave them saviors. Saviors who saved them. From the cruel abuse of their enemies. But as soon as they had it easy again. They were right back at it, more evil. So you turned away and left them again to their fate. To the enemies who came right back. They cried out to you again, in your great compassion. You heard and helped them again. This went on over and over and over. You warned them to return to your revelation. They responded with haughty arrogance. They brushed off your commands, spurned your rules. The very words by which men and women live. They set their jaws in defiance. They turned their backs on you and didn't listen. You put up with them year after year. And warned them by your spirit through your prophets. But when they refused to listen. You abandoned them to foreigners. Still, because of your great compassion. You didn't make a total end to them. You didn't walk out and leave them for good. Yes, you are a God of grace and compassion. And now, our God, the great God. God majestic and terrible, loyal in covenant and love. Don't treat lightly the trouble that has come to us. To our kings and princes, our priests and prophets. Our ancestors, and all your people from the time. Of the Assyrian kings right down to today. You are not to blame. For all that has come down on us. You did everything right. We did everything wrong. None of our kings, princes, priests, or ancestors. Followed your revelation. They ignored your commands. Dismissed the warnings you gave them. Even when they had their own kingdom. And were enjoying your generous goodness. Living in that spacious and fertile land. That you spread out before them. They didn't serve you. Or turn their backs on the practice of evil. And here we are, slaves again today. And here's the land you gave our ancestors. So they could eat well and enjoy a good life. And now look at us, no better than slaves on this land. Its wonderful crops go to the kings. You put over us because of our sins. They act like they own our bodies. And do whatever they like with our cattle. We're in deep trouble. Because of all this we are drawing up a binding pledge, a sealed document signed by our princes, our Levites, and our priests. The sealed document bore these signatures, Nehemiah the governor, son of Hakaliah, Zedekiah, Sariah, Azariah, Jeremiah, Hashur, Amariah, Malkijah, Adish, Shebaniah, Malak, Haram, Mirmoth, Obadiah, Daniel, Jinathon, Baruch, Meshullam, Abijah, Majamin, Maziah, Bilgai, 
and Shemaiah, these were the priests. The Levites, Jeshua son of Azaniah, Binui of the sons of Henadad, Cadmiel, and their kinsmen, Shebaniah, Hodiah, Keladah, Peliah, Hanan, Micah, Rehob, Hashabiah, Zachar, Sherebiah, Shebaniah, Hodiah, Bani, and Beninu. The heads of the people, Parash, Pahath Moab, Elam, Zatu, Bani, Buni, Asgad, Bibe, Adonijah, Bigvi, Aden, Ater, Hezekiah, Azar, Hodiah, Hazhum, Bazai, Harif, Anathoth, Nebai, Magpish, Meshullam, Hezer, Meshizabal, Zadok, Jajua, Pelatiah, Hanan, Aniah, Hozhi, Hananiah, Hashub, Halahesh, Pilha, Shobek, Rehum, Hashabna, Messiah, Ahiah, Hanan, Anan, Malak, Haram, and Bana. The rest of the people, priests, Levites, security guards, singers, temple staff, and all who separated themselves from the foreign neighbors to keep the revelation of God, together with their wives, sons, daughters, everyone old enough to understand, all joined their noble kinsmen in a binding oath to follow the revelation of God given through Moses the servant of God, to keep and carry out all the commandments of God our Master, all His decisions and standards. Thus, we will not marry our daughters to our foreign neighbors nor let our sons marry their daughters. When the foreign neighbors bring goods or grain to sell on the Sabbath we won't trade with them, not on the Sabbath or any other holy day every seventh year we will leave the land fallow and cancel all debts. We accept the responsibility for paying an annual tax of one-third of a shekel, about an eighth ounce, for providing the temple of our God with bread for the table, regular grain offerings, regular whole burnt offerings, offerings for the Sabbaths, new moons, and appointed feasts, dedication offerings, absolution offerings to atone for Israel, maintenance of the temple of our God. We, priests, Levites, and the people, have cast lots to see when each of our families will bring wood for burning on the altar of our God, following the yearly schedule set down in the Revelation. We take responsibility for delivering annually to the temple of God the first fruits of our crops and our orchards, our firstborn sons and cattle, and the firstborn from our herds and flocks for the priests who serve in the temple of our God, just as it is set down in the Revelation. We will bring the best of our grain, of our contributions, of the fruit of every tree, of wine, and of oil to the priests in the storerooms of the temple of our God that we will bring the tithes from our fields to the Levites, since the Levites are appointed to collect the tithes in the towns where we work. We'll see to it that a priest descended from Aaron will supervise the Levites as they collect the tithes and make sure that they take a tenth of the tithes to the treasury in the temple of our God. We'll see to it that the people of Israel and Levites bring the grain, wine, and oil to the storage rooms where the vessels of the sanctuary are kept and where the priests who serve, the security guards, and the choir meet that we will not neglect the temple of our God. The leaders of the people were already living in Jerusalem, so the rest of the people drew lots to get one out of ten to move to Jerusalem, the holy city, while the other nine remained in their towns. The people applauded those who voluntarily offered to live in Jerusalem. These are the leaders in the province who resided in Jerusalem, some Israelites, priests, Levites, temple staff, and descendants of Solomon's slaves lived in the towns of Judah on their own property in various towns, others from both Judah and Benjamin lived in Jerusalem. From the family of Judah, Athiah son of Uzziah, the son of Zechariah, the son of Amariah, the son of Shephatiah, the son of Mahalalel, from the family line of Perez, Messiah son of Baruch, the son of Kalhos, the son of Haziah, the son of Adaiah, the son of Joyarib, the son of Zechariah, the son of the Shilonite. The descendants of Perez who lived in Jerusalem numbered 468 valiant men. From the family of Benjamin, Salo son of Meshullam, the son of Jod, 
the son of Padiah, the son of Kaliah, the son of Messiah, the son of Ithiel, the son of Jeshea, and his brothers Gabbai and Salai, 928 men. Joel son of Zikri was their chief and Judah son of Hasanua was second in command over the city. From the priests, Jediah son of Joyarim, Jachin, Sariah son of Hilkiah, the son of Meshullam, the son of Zadok, the son of Meraeth, the son of Ahitub, supervisor of the temple of God, along with their associates responsible for work in the temple, 822 men. Also Adaya son of Jeraham, the son of Peleliah, the son of Amzi, the son of Zechariah, the son of Pashur, the son of Malkijah, and his associates who were heads of families, 242 men, Amashsai son of Azrael, the son of Atsai, the son of Meshilamoth, the son of Immer, and his associates, all valiant men, 128 men. Their commander was Zabdiel son of Hegedalim. From the Levites, Shemaiah son of Hashub, the son of Azrakim, the son of Hashabiah, the son of Buni, Shabbatai and Josabad, two of the leaders of the Levites who were in charge of the outside work of the Temple of God, Matania son of Micah, the son of Zabdi, the son of Azaph, the director who led in thanksgiving and prayer, Bakbukiah, second among his associates, and Abda son of Shamua, the son of Galo, the son of Jeduthun. The Levites in the holy city totaled 284. From the security guards, the cub, Talman, and their associates who kept watch over the gates, 172 men. The rest of the Israelites, priests, and Levites were in all the towns of Judah, each on his own family property. The temple staff lived on the hill Awful. Ziha and Gishba were responsible for them. The chief officer over the Levites in Jerusalem was Uzi son of Bani, the son of Hashabiah, the son of Matania, the son of Micah. Uzi was one of Azaph's descendants, singers who led worship in the temple of God. The singers got their orders from the king, who drew up their daily schedule. Pethahiah son of Meshizabal, a descendant of Zerah son of Judah, represented the people's concerns at the royal court. Some of the Judeans lived in the villages near their farms, Kiriath Arba, Hebron, and suburbs Dibon and suburbs Jechabzeel and suburbs Jeshua Malada Beth Palet Hazar Shul Beersheba and suburbs Ziklag Makona and suburbs and Rimen Zora Jarmat Zanoa Adullam and their towns Lachish and its fields Azika and suburbs, they were living all the way from Beersheba to the valley of Hinnom. The Benjaminites from Geba lived in Mikmash Ija Bethel and its suburbs Anathoth Nab and Anania Hazer Rama and Gitaim Hadid, Zeboim, and Nebalat Lod and Ono and the Valley of the Craftsmen. Also, some of the Levitical groups of Judah were assigned to Benjamin. These are the priests and Levites who came up with Zerubbabel son of Shealtiel and with Jeshua, Sariah, Jeremiah, Ezra, Amaria, Malak. Hadash, Shechaniah, Rehum, Mirmoth, Ido, Jinathon, Abijah, Majamin, Moadiah, Bilga, Shemaiah, Joyarim, Jediah, Salu, Amak, Hilkiah, and Jediah, these were the leaders of the priests during the time of Jeshua. And the Levites, Jeshua, Binui, Kadmiel, Sherebiah, Judah, Matania, with his brothers, was in charge of songs of praise, and their brothers Bakbukiah and Uni stood opposite them in the services of worship. Jeshua fathered Joachim, Joachim fathered Eliashib, Eliashib fathered Joyada, Joyada fathered Jonathan, and Jonathan fathered Jajua. During the time of Joachim, these were the heads of the priestly families, of the family of Sariah, Moriah, of Jeremiah, Hananiah, of Ezra, Meshullam, of Amaria, Jehohanan, of Malak, Jonathan, of Shechaniah, Joseph, of Haram, Adna, of Mirmoth, Helkai, of Ido, Zechariah, of Jinathon, Meshullam, of Abijah, Zikri, of Miniamin and Moadiah, 
Piltai, of Bilga, Shamua, of Shemaiah, Jehonathan, of Joyarib, Madanai, of Jediah, Uzi, of Salu, Kaulai, of Amuk, Eber, of Hilkiah, Hashabiah, and of Jediah, Nethanel. During the time of Eliashib, Joyada, Johanan, and Jajua, the Levites were registered as heads of families. During the reign of Darius the Persian, the priests were registered. The Levites who were heads of families were registered in the book of the Chronicles until the time of Johanan son of Eliashib. These were Hashabiah, Sherebiah, and Jeshua son of Cadmiel, their brothers stood opposite them to give praise and thanksgiving, one side responding to the other, as had been directed by David the man of God. The security guards included Matania, Bakbukia, Obadiah, Meshullam, Talman, and a cub they guarded the storerooms at the gates. They lived during the time of Joachim son of Jeshua, the son of Josadak, the time of Nehemiah the governor and of Ezra the priest and scholar. When it came time for the dedication of the wall, they tracked down and brought in the Levites from all their homes in Jerusalem to carry out the dedication with exuberance, thanksgiving hymns, songs, cymbals, harps, and lutes. The singers assembled from all around Jerusalem, from the villages of the Netophathites, from Beth Gilgal, from the farms at Geba and Asmaveth, the singers had built villages for themselves all around Jerusalem. The priests and Levites ceremonially purified themselves, then they did the same for the people, the gates, and the wall. I had the leaders of Judah come up on the wall, and I appointed two large choirs. One proceeded on the wall to the right toward the dumb gate. Hashea and half the leaders of Judah followed them, including Azariah, Ezra, Meshullam, Judah, Benjamin, Shemaiah, and Jeremiah. Some of the young priests had trumpets. Next, playing the musical instruments of David the man of God, came Zechariah son of Jonathan, the son of Shemaiah, the son of Metaniah, the son of Micaiah, the son of Zachar, the son of Azaph, and his brothers Shemaiah, Azrael, Melali, Helali, Maai, Nethanel, Judah, and Hanani. Ezra the scholar led them. At the fountain gate they went straight ahead, up the steps of the city of David using the wall stairway above the house of David to the water gate on the east. The other choir proceeded to the left. I and half of the people followed them on the wall from the tower of furnaces to the broad wall, over the Ephraim gate, the Jeshana gate, the fish gate, the tower of Hananel, and the tower of the hundred as far as the sheep gate, stopping at the prison gate. The two choirs then took their places in the temple of God. I was there with half of the officials, along with the priests Eliakim, Messiah, Miniamin, Micaiah, Elioenai, Zechariah, and Hananiah with their trumpets. Also Messiah, Shemaiah, Eliezer, Uzi, Jehohanan, Malkijah, Elam, and Ezer. The singers, directed by Jezrahiah, made the rafters ring. That day they offered great sacrifices, an exuberant celebration because God had filled them with great joy. The women and children raised their happy voices with all the rest. Jerusalem's jubilation was heard far and wide. That same day men were appointed to be responsible for the storerooms for the offerings, the firstfruits, and the tithes. They saw to it that the portion directed by the revelation for the priests and Levites was brought in from the farms connected to the towns. Judah was so appreciative of the priests and Levites and their service, they, along with the singers and security guards, had done everything so well, conducted the worship of their God and the ritual of ceremonial cleansing in a way that would have made David and his son Solomon proud. That's the way it was done in the olden days, the days of David and Azaph, when they had choir directors for singing songs of praise and thanksgiving to God. During the time of Zerubbabel and Nehemiah, 
all Israel contributed the daily allowances for the singers and security guards. They also set aside what was dedicated to the Levites, and the Levites did the same for the Aaronites. Also on that same day there was a reading from the book of Moses in the hearing of the people. It was found written there that no Ammonite or Moabite was permitted to enter the congregation of God, because they hadn't welcomed the people of Israel with food and drink, they even hired Balaam to work against them by cursing them, but our God turned the curse into a blessing. When they heard the reading of the Revelation, they excluded all foreigners from Israel. Some time before this, Eliashib the priest had been put in charge of the storerooms of the Temple of God. He was close to Tobiah and had made available to him a large storeroom that had been used to store grain offerings, incense, worship vessels, and the tithes of grain, wine, and oil for the Levites, singers, and security guards, and the offerings for the priests. When this was going on I wasn't there in Jerusalem, in the thirty-second year of Artaxerxes king of Babylon, I had traveled back to the king. But later I asked for his permission to leave again. I arrived in Jerusalem and learned of the wrong that Eliashib had done in turning over to him a room in the courts of the Temple of God. I was angry, really angry, and threw everything in the room out into the street, all of Tobiah's stuff. Then I ordered that they ceremonially cleanse the room. Only then did I put back the worship vessels of the Temple of God, along with the grain offerings and the incense. And then I learned that the Levites hadn't been given their regular food allotments. So the Levites and singers who led the services of worship had all left and gone back to their farms. I called the officials on the carpet, why has the temple of God been abandoned? I got everyone back again and put them back on their jobs so that all Judah was again bringing in the tithe of grain, wine, and oil to the storerooms. I put Shelemiah the priest, Zadok the scribe, and a Levite named Padiah in charge of the storerooms. I made Hanan son of Zachar, the son of Matania, their right-hand man. These men had a reputation for honesty and hard work. They were responsible for distributing the rations to their brothers. Remember me, O oh my God, for this. Don't ever forget the devoted work I have done for the temple of God and its worship. During those days, while back in Judah, I also noticed that people treaded wine presses, brought in sacks of grain, and loaded up their donkeys on the Sabbath. They brought wine, grapes, figs, and all kinds of stuff to sell on the Sabbath. So I spoke up and warned them about selling food on that day. Tyrians living there brought in fish and whatever else, selling it to Judeans, in Jerusalem, mind you, on the Sabbath. I confronted the leaders of Judah, what's going on here? This evil, profaning the Sabbath, isn't this exactly what your ancestors did? And because of it didn't God bring down on us and this city all this misery? And here you are adding to it, accumulating more wrath on Jerusalem by profaning the Sabbath. As the gates of Jerusalem were darkened by the shadows of the approaching Sabbath, I ordered the doors shut and not to be opened until the Sabbath was over. I placed some of my servants at the gates to make sure that nothing to be sold would get in on the Sabbath day. Traders and dealers in various goods camped outside the gates once or twice. But I took them to task.